Okay, hello everyone and um, welcome to this short training event. Today we're going to focus on exploring the UCSC Genome Browser. My name is Pip Griffin from the EMBL Australia Bioinformatics resource and I'm your host for today. My colleague Christina Hall from EMBL ABR is in Melbourne um, co-hosting. So EMBL ABR is a distributed national research infrastructure network um, providing bioinformatics support to life science researchers in Australia. We currently have 13 nodes across Australia, each of which undertake or support bioinformatics activities around um, the key areas of data, compute, tools, training platforms and standards. And a major priority across this network is bioinformatics training and that's why we're here today. So in this short um, introductory training session, we'll explore the UCSC Genome Browser, which is a free to use genome browser, hosting a broad collection of vertebrate and model organism genome assemblies and annotations and a large suite of tools for viewing, analyzing and downloading the data. We have 63 attendees registered across five sites in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. And our lead trainer today is Dr. Robert Kuhn, Associate Director of the UCSC Genome Browser. Bob received his PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, where he studied the centromeres of yeast. Following a postdoc position at UC Berkeley and USDA Plant Gene Expression Center, he taught biochemistry, molecular biology and genetics at UC Santa Cruz. He then joined the UCSC Genome Browser Project in 2003, where he's now Associate Director with a particular interest in clinical genetics. Bob spends considerable effort training people in the use of the browser, helping bring the fruits of the human and other genome projects to scientists worldwide and learning from them how to improve it. Today, we also have nine helpers across the participating sites who have all volunteered their time, both in a attending a training event two weeks ago and in organising the local event at your node, as well, of course, being there to um, help locally today. So without, without their help, this event wouldn't have been possible. So I'd like to acknowledge them for donating their time and all of their efforts in organising and helping with, with this event. So in California, we have Louis Nassar helping Bob behind the scenes. In Sydney, at the University of Sydney, we have Tracy Chu. At the University of Queensland in St Lucia, we have Mike Tang, Tom Cudahy, Zach Stewart, and also um, Dom Gorse, who was instrumental in organising this series of training events. In Adelaide, we have Juan Carlos Sanchez, who's also being helped by Gareth Price from UQ. In Melbourne, at the University of Melbourne, we have Gail Phillip and Vicky Perot and Christina Hall. Um, and finally, in Townsville at JCU, we have Natalia Andrada Rodriguez. Um, so they are, I think, still experiencing some difficulties on their end getting um, a video and sound from their room, but they, as I said, they can hopefully hear us okay. So before I hand over to Bob, I'll mention some logistics and how to get involved in this session. Bob's delivering the content over video conferencing today. All five sites will generally be muted throughout the workshop to stop background noise, especially when Bob's speaking. Um, at certain times during the session, however, uh, facilitators can re request to be unmuted so they can speak directly with Bob to relay queries and so on. We'll be running through a number of exercises today um, and you should have printouts of both the exercises and the schedule. Um, so you'll have a go at, at Part one first, we'll spend 20 minutes on part one, then Bob will give a demo of that exercise and answer any questions. And I'll tell you how to ask questions in a minute. Um, we'll then move to part two and three, um, one after the other as part two is quite short. Again, we'll all come together, Bob will give another demo and answer any questions that have arisen from those exercises and so on. After part four, um, We'll have a, a bit of a break, which you can use to finish off any exercises that you're still working on if you need to. It's quite important that we try to stay in sync across the venues. So participants, please let your helpers know if you need more time or if you're finishing exercises early and helpers will make that known to us. Um, you should have been given some post-it notes in your room, one pink and one green. You, you can use these to communicate with the helpers in your room. If you're having any issues, please put the pink post-it note um, somewhere visible, like stick it to your computer screen to flag that you need help or you have a question. And then you can um, use the green post-it note to flag that you're finished exercises or everything's going fine. We also have a shared discussion board. 
that everyone can edit and use to raise questions online, and this will be visible to all participants and, and the trainers. Um, so feel free to ask and answer any questions or make comments as we go. Louis and Bob will also be looking at the discussion board periodically and will be available to answer your questions. So I'd like to also draw your attention to the link at the um, top of the discussion board to EMBL ABR's code of conduct, which outlines the behaviour that's expected at this or any EMBL ABR event, both in the physical location where, where you are, as well as online, which just includes the discussion board. So in a nutshell, all participants are expected to make the event welcoming for everyone present and to show respect and courtesy to all others. So please have a read of this document to make sure you're familiar with the content. Finally, if you want to revisit any part of today's training, the recording of selected parts will be made available on the EMBL ABR YouTube channel for your future reference. And we'll let you know by email uh, when this is available. Okay, so now I'll hand over to Bob for the session. Thanks, Pip, can you hear me? Okay, um, <clears throat> and I'm sharing my screen, is that right? Okay, I can't hear you. Sorry, I, I can't see your screen at the moment. Okay, I thought I was sharing it. Share there, okay. We are now good, Bob. Maybe now? Yes, mm -hmm. now is good. Great, thank you. Uh, so I wanna open uh, by uh, thanking uh, Pip for her amazing uh, organizational effort on all of this, and uh, Dom Gorse for uh, initiating it and getting things started. And also uh, Lou Nassar here, who is uh, my right-hand man today, and as he has been for the last three, he's uh, helping a lot with fielding questions and so forth. And to all the helpers out there whom I haven't met, uh, except very remotely through the, uh, the previous session we had. Um, so the goal today is to work through the, uh, the practical, which I understand you all have hard copies of. It's also available on this URL in the middle of my screen here, bit.ly slash UCSC capital A capital U for Australia 2018. Uh, there's also some content there at, the, uh, at that location, uh, which will be useful during the, uh, uh, during the workshop, uh, during the practical. Um, the uh, idea of the, uh, the practical is to set up some problems, uh, to pose a problem, and then to provide some steps and some bullet points to lead you toward uh, the solution. Um, the bullet points are not hard and fast, hand, hold your hand instructions to get you to the, uh, uh, to the end point because I don't believe that you necessarily engage your brain if you are working that way and you don't really realize what you've done at the end of it. So they're designed to be a little bit obscure, to nudge you in the right direction, to get you thinking about it so that you kind of internalize how to think about the browser and how to use it. For some of the exercises along the way, there's some interesting biological um, insights or information. There's information about um, maybe how genomes uh, vary through time. You know, think about the genome projects in general. Uh, we're using primarily HG19, the penultimate human genome lease, are not even part of the UCSC system. So the interface is the same. You see, I mean, uh, HG19 happens to be the best annotated of the genome assemblies, so it's a good place to see what all the capabilities of the browser are. But if you go to cow or sheep or something like that, uh, you'll find that the functionality is the same, it's just that not all the data sets are available, but you're free to make your own and add them as custom tracks. And uh, as Pip was telling you all, that uh, uh, Lou and I are both available for questions. Uh, Lou will be monitoring the, uh, the chat and the stream and so forth. And uh, with that, I don't think I have anything more uh, with respect to introduction. So I will mute my mic at this point and uh, let you get started on the problems, unless there are questions right now. Maybe I'll pause for that to see if there are any questions, any problems people who are not able to see the PDF, anything like that. Okay, so I'm gonna mute and I'll actually stop sharing my screen as well and uh, carry on, thank you. Hello people, this is Bob and Lou in Santa Cruz and I'm going to share my screen and uh, do a quick demo, this 
quick as I can with this long of an exercise. Y'all had 20 minutes and I have five. Um, so instead of going from the very beginning, I'm going to jump to the end of 1D uh, and just use a session to load it on the presumption that you got to 1D okay on your own and you don't need uh, uh, don't need me. So uh, a beautiful thing about the uh, uh, shared sessions thing is that you can load it without um, you can load a session that somebody else has saved without being logged in at all or certainly without being logged in as that person. So I'm going to load username example hg19 underscore fgfr1 snips with all well, capitals in the s and uh, load and then up here where it says browser you click into it. Okay, so the next uh, step was to uh, let's see if I can shrink this thing. Okay, was to uh, export DNA showing exons, introns, and SNPs. So in the top menu, find DNA. and wait for it to load there we go we've got two options get dna which is just a text file and then extended case and color options which lets you actually use the tracks that are turned on to uh, decorate the dna and you can see here that uh, it comes up with ucsc genes already clicked and um, the blue value 255 and lowercase chosen here which is not the default but it's what i saved when i saved the session because the session saves everything, it saves every uh, uh, configuration option all over the browser. So let's check uh, common SNPs will make a capital, we'll make flag SNPs capital, we'll make common SNPs red, flag SNPs green. And let's just underline the SNPs too for fun because it'll be a little easier to spot when you uh, click. Oh, it actually says to do that, doesn't it? And then uh, we'll just hit submit. So we'll grab all the DNA in the window there. And it should come up with all the exons in blue. And then all of the common SNPs in uh, the flag SNPs, we have blue plus green, which is this aqua color. And then the uh, common SNPs, which are likely to not be in the coding regions, are going to be red and underlined. And so I don't see any that uh, are also in the coding region and, uh, and red, because that would be red plus blue, which would be a kind of a magenta color. So let's just go back and uh, zoom to the code on level. So we'll go back to the browser graphic here. And uh, this whole exercise is mostly to show you the different kinds of data that are available in the browser and some of the navigation features. Uh, much of which was uh, demonstrated in the first two uh, webinars. So let's just grab this. Oh, we're supposed to look for Exxon 8, so let's not grab that. And put the mouse over it and see which one it is. There's seven, there's six, so here's eight. It's transcribed on the opposite strand, and we'll zoom into a really narrow region here and zoom in. At this resolution, you can see single letters. And if you zoom in even more, and there's room, you can see the uh, uh, code on numbers. Although that is configurable, if you hit the little button on the left here, you have the option to turn that on or off. Uh, it's on by default these days. In the past, it took a lot to actually draw it, so it was not always on by default. So let's click into the details page uh, of a particular SNP. You can see that I chose it spot in this exon to zoom to where the SNP wasn't visible. So I'm going to type in the SNP number so we can zoom directly to it. So RS727505 369 and go. So that's a way to get it on your screen if you happen to zoom into the wrong spot on the, not the wrong, but a different spot on the, uh, that particular exon, you have the same issue. So we'll grab, uh, SNP 150 here and click into it and it'll give you the SNP in the middle of the screen with some uh, padding around it. So it's a total of uh, 250 on either side there. And so click into the red SNP in 
there are two of them. So let's click into the one in the, uh, not in the flag SNP track, but in the lower track here, the uh, SNP 150 track. And you'll see the kind of data that are available for the SNP. You can see the ancestral allele was A, but we have somebody in the population with a G there. And um, it's likely not very common. Um, you can see it's in this sense variant in these different isoforms of this of these gene, these different isoforms of the FGFR1 gene. And uh, it's a uh, an E to G amino acid change. It's a glutamate to glycine. And in some of our SNP tracks, we actually have the minor allele frequency available. Um, I don't see it on this particular page. So now let's get some phenotypic information. We'll go back to the browser. We'll turn on HGMD and Uniprot, which are in the uh, phenotype group below the blue bar, uh, in the blue bar group phenotype and uh, literature below the browser graphics. So we have to open that up and we turn on, it's in alphabetical order except for the first one or two items in every group. So we'll turn on HGMD variants to pack, Uniprot variants also to pack and hit refresh. And so when you put your mouse over the records, when they finally come up, uh, in some of our tracks, you get some information, some phenotype information. HGMD simply tells you what kind of uh, mutation they are. But in Swiss Pro, they actually give you a, uh, uh, give you a phenotype, trigonocephaly one, for example. So now let's turn on the gene reviews track, which is also in the phenotype group, if I remember correctly. Here it is. We'll turn that on. And these are authoritative articles written by people uh, who have been uh, solicited by uh, NHGRI or by NCBI rather to write uh, about them. Uh, and if you click into the gene review, it's nice to have that track on if you're looking at a large region and you're interested in uh, uh, what phenotypes might be known in that region. So if you click craniosynostosis in this case, it opens up a, a authoritative review in a new window at uh, NCBI to, uh, to show the value of, uh, uh, well, to, to show what's known about that gene. Uh, some of them are getting a little old. I don't know how much effort they're putting into rewriting these. Um, it used to be that they would update them every few years. Uh, this one was a 12 year gap between updates. So I'll just crash that window, go back to the browser. And I'm getting the word here that we need to start part two. So maybe we'll take a moment to see if there are any questions uh, before, uh, before I do that. Uh, I will turn on the conservation track though, because Lou said that there were some questions about that. So let's go to uh, the conservation track in the comparative genomics group, and we'll just turn it on the pack and accept the defaults here, which is uh, something like eight or nine species out of the hundred. And it shows you in descending order away from human in uh, evolutionary time uh, how the uh, conservation stands. And you can see that the exon here is uh, pretty well conserved, and the introns nearby are also very well conserved. If I zoom out by a factor of three, it's even more obvious because you pick up a little more intron. Um, so, okay, so I will let you get on to uh, part two. If you have any questions about part one or about part two as you go, please uh, let us know. I'll scroll down here and you can see how the uh, conservation goes. Thank you. Hi folks, we're back. Um, we got a question about how to interpret the conservation track, which I started to do when we were looking at it uh, earlier. Let me drag it up to the top of the screen here using the mouse over the little uh, white space on the left side so that the conservation track is right next to the genes track. So essentially uh, we have hundred species of which only eight of them are displayed here um, in descending order of conservation uh, relative to how well they are conserved when compared to human. And you can see that rhesus is most dense because at this resolution, uh, rhesus is uh, very, uh, it's much closer to human than any of these other animals. And the coding regions of genes, if the genes are conserved, tend to have conservation as well. And so it's a one-to-one -one, uh, comparison between the two. And in the introns, there's no data because the last common ancestor between zebrafish 
and uh, uh, frog, uh, Xenopus, and chicken. Uh, it's just too far, uh, too long ago for those sequences to be conserved uh, if there's no selection on them. So conservation track is a uh, essentially a measure of uh, evolutionary relatedness between the uh, tracks. So moving on to the answer to uh, a little demo of 3A, go to uh, tools table browser. We'll just leave the browser set up as it is here on this page. And uh, typically when you go to the table browser, it remembers where you were. And so the region we were at was already pre-selected. Uh, but in the current case, let's type in the uh, cytoband 4P16.3. We also have cytoband information available on mouse. So you could type in the mouse uh, cytoband um, identifier there. And uh, those are two species for which uh, there is microscopic gem sustaining uh, metaphase chromosome uh, designations available. And so let's go to the uh, genes and gene predictions group, track UCSC genes, and grab the table known canonical out of the, uh, the pull down menu here because the canonical uh, gene represents a single isoform of the gene. And our output then will have one isoform per gene instead of having. Uh, a row for every uh, every isoform. And then we go to, uh, what's the next step here? We need to go to selected fields for primary and related tables, which I'm not sure was on the, uh, the handout there, but then get output gives us an opportunity to choose uh, which data fields we're interested in. Was it in there? Doesn't look like it. Selected fields. Huh? Okay, so we'll go to Chrome, Chrome Start, Chrome End. We'll grab gene symbol and description. And I apologize for not specifying that the, uh, the uh, output format should be in selected fields because that is uh, a key part here. And it's not, it's not something that's actually obvious to you as a user. So if we hit get output now, we've chosen which data fields we're interested in. And we should get the coordinates, gene name, and a short description of all of the genes in this region. And you can see here, we're still on chromosome four. Uh, we have some zinc fingers here and a number of other genes, but you can see that none of them are repeated multiple times. It does look like we've got a couple of copies of this zinc finger right here. So this is a way to get information, selected information about genes uh, in a particular region. You can also do it by loading a group of genes, even if they're not contiguous in the, in the genome, you can get the same kind of information by loading a group of genes back at the table browser. And I'll show you that real quickly before we uh, uh, leave this particular page. Uh, right here, you can paste the list or upload a list if it's long. And so you can have that same kind of information from a group of genes whether or not they're in the same cytoband or the same region of the genome by coordinates. Okay, so 3A instructs us to load a group of custom tracks from the URL. So let's go back to the genome browser and hide all as it asks us to, and then turn the uh, UCSE genes track back to pack. So hide all is actually one of my favorite buttons because it lets me clean up the screen and get rid of a lot of the uh, stuff I've been doing if I want to get going on a new uh, train of thought. So you can see at this resolution, there are a lot of SNPs in a band, four and a half megabases uh, in extent. So we'll go down here, past all the SNPs. And finally, past the Unipro. Finally down here, we'll hide all. And I wish there was a button that was hide all except the genes track, because I do find myself doing this a lot. bit.ly slash UCSCAU2018. ctexamples.txt. And you can grab either the data by highlighting it all and copying it, or grab the URL. So I'm going to copy the URL. Uh, the result is the same. When you get back to the browser, you have something to paste into this add custom tracks, which you can access either by the button below the graphic 
or My Data Custom Tracks. Uh, both of those links take you to the same location. Paste it into the browser and submit. Then the next instruction is to click into the uh, POS uh, column here, chromosome six, gets you to the uh, first track in the browser. So this demonstrates how you get your own data into the browser in a number of different formats. And I'll leave it to you to uh, investigate the relationship between all of those tracks that you just saw on that intermediate page and the actual display of those tracks on this page and the original data on, on this uh, other page. You can see fairly easily the relationship between some of the parameters in the, uh, in the header here and what you get to see on the screen. And then let's look at the biological consequences, but let's go to, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the biological consequences of this track here, which is the only one uh, that's displayed here that uh, can be loaded into the, uh, um, right, the only one that can be loaded into the variant annotation integrator uh, because it has the proper type of information. It has the um, reference allele as well as the non-reference allele. And in that way, the VAI can interpret for you uh, what the change will mean biologically or biochemically. And so that track comes preloaded here, my SNP custom track. That's the name of the, uh, the track that we gave it when we loaded it in. We'll accept all of the defaults, but you can see that there are a lot of things. You can look at DNA hypersensitivity. And this is available on all of our genomes. If there's a gene set, then uh, it'll show up here. Uh, in, in human, we have multiple gene sets that you can choose from, and it will annotate your DNA uh, changes relative to that gene set. Uh, you can see also that you can intersect with conservation uh, and so forth um, if those data are available. The conservation track is available on all genomes uh, that we host in the UCSC browser, except that the 100 way is restricted to human. Uh, cow has about a dozen, mouse has 60, and the uh, further away from human, the less likely it is to have a really large conservation track, but it will usually have a conservation uh, track that includes human and some of its own nearest neighbors. So we'll switch it to a HTML output, makes it easier to, uh, to read on the page, get results, satisfy the lawyers with a click on the box there. And then uh, here's where you have the output. Uh, interesting things about the output, if it's in a coding region, it will give you the amino acid change. It'll tell you where it is, in which amino acid it's in. Uh, which nucleotide it's in, it'll tell you the nucleotide change. If it's already present in the genome uh, databases, dbSNP will give you that. And then the SIFT and polyfen scores are annotated at the top, what they, they mean in terms of benign, uh, damaging, pathogenic, and so forth. They, each of those tools has their own, has its own uh, output type. So I think that's a quick and dirty run through parts two and three. And we're just about on time to turn you loose on part four. So if there are any questions, Lou's been looking. Uh, we have any questions over there? Not right now. Lou says no, so I'm going mute and I'm gonna unshare my screen. Thank you. Hello folks, we're back. So this particular exercise goes via sessions. Once again, we'll load a session to show you how a BAM file looks when it's loaded into the browser. The uh, BAM format, the binary alignment mapping format is the way uh, data come out of uh, sequencing centers once they've been aligned and your home genome uh, has coordinates, you know, your reads have coordinates, the reads that come off the machine. So username example again, HD underscore BAM snips is to load this uh, session. And so this is loading a file remotely from a server somewhere. It doesn't matter where it is. And in practice, it's going to be your server. When you get data back from your sequencing center, you have um, uh, a BAM file. And so every read on the browser, I'm sorry, every read in the file represents a short uh, bit of sequence that came out of the machine. So I'm gonna click on the browser link right there and uh, aligns to the genome. Uh, so here's a chunk, it's 
20 bases long or something, and there's a single base mismatch, a G over here is a homozygous T. This came from a cell line, this particular uh, uh, sample. And a, an antibody was used to pull out a, uh, a factor of some kind that was bound to DNA. And then uh, the DNA was sequenced to determine where the binding site for that factor was. And you can see here that uh, this format, BAM, uh, allows you to, uh, you get for free with your BAM file, a, a representation of uh, a poor uh, alignment quality over here. So this G is not any, uh, uh, not of any significance. Probably the C isn't either because it's one of a bunch of reads and it's the only one that's a mismatch. And so uh, it lets you look at the quality of your, uh, of your alignment. And then if you zoom out, let's see, let's stick with the instructions here. So uh, zoom out 10x twice. So we'll, we'll do that. And you can see as you get further out, your mismatches turn into little red tick marks because we don't have room anymore to uh, annotate them with a, uh, a nucleotide character. And then we zoom out by a factor of 10. And here at this level, what you're seeing is essentially the coverage. You're seeing how many reads there are uh, over various uh, locations. And you can see that these two genes are divergently transcribed. So essentially uh, that antibody, whatever it was, uh, picked up something uh, that's associated with the five prime ends of these genes. And there are data actually for the whole chromosome 21 here. So you could zoom around and see if that's really true. If the uh, five prime ends of the genes tend to be the places where uh, there is signal. So 4B says, observe the reads as a wiggle density graph. So here you have individual reads that are aligned and they're, um, they have a footprint on the genome. Uh, it's not uncommon to just wanna know what your coverage is just to see how many reads you have in a particular re uh, region and you can, see where the coverage is, but you can't get any, uh, it's not a smooth graph as uh, some people would like to see. So relatively recently, we added a display mode where if you click into this little button over here, this little button is the uh, configuration button and every track has one and uh, every track has some configuration options, although it varies quite a bit uh, which options are available and which tracks. So down here, display uh, density graph here, and if you click on that, you get a, a, a menu that allows you to uh, display it as a bar graph. We'll just accept 128 uh, height, uh, pixel height uh, as the default. And then we'll zoom back up at the top of the page. And for it to be really uh, visible as a graph, we have to switch it from pack to full and then hit submit. And there are other display options available on that page for configuring it. You can put a horizontal line through it at a certain level and so forth. And so now we not only have a density graph, which are the same data, uh, it's inverted relative to having the individual reads uh, mapping the way they were, uh, but you also get a value. So you can say here at this location, it's uh, uh, 20 fold fold coverage, 27 fold coverage. Uh, you could take another region of the genome and just zoom in randomly here to, uh, 21Q22 and uh, see what you have there. And so at this location, you have up to 49 fold coverage on this particular uh, region. And so it shows you the, uh, the read depth at every location. If you were doing whole exome sequencing, those peaks would be right over the exons and not in the introns and you'd be able to see what your read depth was. Sometimes there will be an exon that's not uh, very well covered because of GC content or maybe it's significant biologically, maybe that particular isoform with that exon in it, if it's differentially spliced, will be in one tissue and not another tissue. And so it'll be informative at the biological level where your read depth uh, becomes important uh, to you in terms of interpreting your data. You can get these in, uh, data uh, bioinformatically as well, um, but it's nice to be able to look at it in the browser, which is a lot more intuitive sometimes uh, when you're looking at an entire data set at once. So I think our schedule, has us to take a 10 minute break right now and we're right on schedule according to my clock. So over and out for 10, see ya. Lou chimes in that hopefully people will have uh, questions while we're timed out and we hope so. That gives him something to do and uh, me too while you're working. All right, I'm back. 
So we have questions from various places. I don't know where from, but uh, Lou tells me one of the questions is, um, can you use the table browser to get the coordinates of exons? And uh, you can indeed. And so right here, we happen to have this gene here, herb one. And so I'm just gonna use that as an example. So let's go to the table browser, uh, tools table browser, and um, it comes up with the custom track uh, pre-selected, but let's just go to the genes and gene predictions track and we'll accept the default, which will be the UCSC genes track after it redraws here. There we go. And the known gene track. Uh, you can also use the known canonical, uh, but I'll just leave that uh, as it is. And under output format, if you choose to go to a bed file, browser extensible data as an output, when you hit get output, then one of the options is to get the data in a big chunk and look at the genes or um, actually it's quite sensitive to the, uh, the gene structure. So you can get exons only here and um, you can also get uh, these various other things, coding exons only and so forth. But actually before I do that, I'm gonna use my mount back button quickly because I wanna make sure that I'm choosing only the region I was in and not the whole genome before I do that. Yeah, see, whole genome, we would have gotten a massive file out of that. So let's just go to the position here that we were at and had a couple of exons in it. We'll get output and we'll uh, make sure that the uh, exons are selected. And then we'll get our uh, uh, exons plus no padding at either end and we'll just get the bed file directly there. If you wanna make a custom track out of it and see it separately, you can, um, put some information up here. And so here we are with the coordinates. So it's the name of the isoform, underscore exon zero, because I have bioinformaticians count starting at zero uh, and so forth. So here are the coordinates of the exons. And I'm pretty sure that if you use the um, no canonical table, you'll get just one uh, uh, per gene, rather one isoform per gene rather than all of them. But you might miss a couple of exons if there's differential splicing and other isoforms may have other uh, exons. So let's go back to the browser. And, uh, oh yeah, the other question that came in is can you find the intersection between two uh, tracks, uh, such as a bed track and a so transcription like factor binding file. site? Yeah, or two BAM files. Uh, you can indeed using the table browser. So let's just go to the table browser. And I'm not going to demonstrate it right now because we don't actually have two such tracks turned on. But uh, you use the intersection function here. And so uh, if you're gonna do an intersection, you have two tables to deal with and the results will come out in the format of whichever table you choose first. So if you want your answers to come out in coordinates from your BAM file, you would choose your BAM file first. And if you wanted it in terms of where, which transcription factor intersects with the BAM file, you would choose your transcription factor uh, uh, track first. So once you do the uh, uh, intersection, so let's say we create an intersection between the genes and uh, this BAM file, you could choose the BAM file as your second track. And the, actually the next exercise uh, where we're going to deal with an RNA-seq track which is similar in some ways to a processed BAM track that has uh, coverage where you've actually converted the individual reads into a value at each nucleotide and it gives you a coverage track. That's a lot like an RNA-seq track and that uh, in here is where you choose your secondary track and I'm not gonna actually do it by demo, uh, but you can use the next exercise, which is essentially to cherry pick the peaks. You say, okay, give me the best part of the peak, the stuff I'm most interested in and put it in a separate track, put it in a, a custom track. And then those peaks can be used to intersect with uh, whatever secondary file you like. And so I'm gonna defer any more conversation about the intersections until after we've done number five and see if uh, the questioner um, is satisfied with what I've talked about so far in a sketch uh, perspective uh, or not. And then we can carry on from there if necessary. So I'm gonna stop my share and go mute and let you carry on with the next step. Thank you very much.
Okay, it's 6.45 here and something 45 there, unless you're in Adelaide, then it's 15. <laughs> uh, I feel sorry for you all down in Adelaide after change time. When you do time comparisons, it's always off by a half. Okay, number five, make a custom track out of RNA-seq data from ENCODE project with uh, expression levels above some threshold. Uh, this one shows you how you might manipulate your own data, but it's using a little data that's already present in the browser uh, to start with as an example. And uh, we get to take advantage of the, uh, the handy sessions tool, which lets us go directly to the starting place without having to describe it in uh, uh, laborious detail. So let's just go to the store settings, uh, HG19 underscore um, P53RNA and submit username example. So these examples should all, sessions should all be working on Genome Asia as well as UCSC. It's weird that UCSC was blocked in, uh, what was it, Adelaide? Uh, but uh, Genome Asia was not. But Okay, so let's just load the browser uh, session here. And the first thing it says is what's the cutoff signal uh, value for this track? And so you can see on the left-hand side of each track here, uh, it tells you that you're looking at data from one to 100, and you can see a pink hat at the top here indicating there's data off screen. Um, and you can configure it by clicking into the, uh, uh, one of these tracks with, like, with the right mouse button. You can configure just this track. But for now, we're not gonna configure it uh, we want to say, okay, let's say, for example, you want to use that as a cutoff and you're really interested in the stuff that's above 100, the biggest peak. Obviously, this can be used to cherry pick your best peaks or it can be used at the bottom to throw away the noise and just get to the stuff that's uh, uh, out of the noise in your uh, estimation. Um, so click into the topmost of the four tracks to learn the name of the track. And these encode tracks have these ridiculously long names. And so it, and it's in a big menu full of other stuff. So it's really hard to find the track. Uh, the table browser has a nice way though, of if you're clicked into the detail of a track, then when you go to the table browser, it comes up pre-selected. So that's pretty handy for this because this is whole genome and code, Cold Spring Harbor, long RNA seq from this particular cell line. It's whole cell, it's poly A plus, it's on the minus strand and it's the raw signal and it's replicate one. So who wants to remember all that, right? So let's go from tools, table browser and it comes up pre-selected and it saves us the trouble of uh, uh, having to remember that or figure it out or find it in the pull down menus. And you can see here that we've got a lot of tables. So I'm not gonna, uh, so lots of tables there. Uh, um, this is given by way of example, what you might do with your own data. And so now let's make a filter to just cherry pick the data that we're interested in and we'll get the data that are above that threshold. So we'll pull out all the data that are greater than uh, 100 value. Uh, you can choose greater than or greater than equal, I don't care which. Uh, let's just say greater than, and we'll say greater than 100, and we'll export the data here. We'll submit that. Uh, we're actually just submitting the filter. We're not actually uh, uh, executing the filter just yet, but we're choosing the filter for greater than 100. We wanna make sure that the position is uh, highlighted here rather than do the entire data set. We'll just do what's inside the window and uh, get output. So now we have a custom track uh, uh, as an option in the uh, get output. Uh, oh, actually I didn't wanna do that. So these are the data, this is what they look like. We have a value at every uh, nucleotide. So I'll go back here and I will choose to create a custom track as my output so we can actually see it in the browser. So output format, custom track, then get output. And then uh, we're asked to give uh, the tracks a name. Uh, it gives us table browser and code. So I'll just say name uh, top of peaks. Oh, it looks like I've done that before. Top of peaks, uh, description, uh, all values above 100. Um, the instructions probably say something different. So get custom track in genome browser. And we have 374 data points. I'll click here to continue. How much time do I have? Another five? Yeah. Five, okay. 
And so we actually didn't set our visibility to anything. So you'll see we have a new group here, custom tracks, usually your data right here on top. Let's turn the darn thing on. We could have chosen that back at the custom track uh, uh, page. I usually forget to do it there. And uh, now we'll see our data, our custom track data. And I'm gonna drag the track down here below the jeans track. So it's sitting right on top of the place where it comes from. And so the next step is to make it the same scale because these peaks are outsized. They simply uh, took some default parameters. You can see here that this is zero to 100 and this is 100 to 150. So it's bigger than it ought to be. Um, let's click into this one first using the uh, right mouse button and the configure button. So we'll see how many pixels high it is. It's 100 data points, but we're gonna wanna know how many uh, pixels per data point. So the track is 50, so it's 50 pixels per 100 data points. So it's one pixel per two data points. So let's just crash that without changing it. And now we have 50 data points, so we're gonna want 25 pixels to put it at the same track. Uh, I'm sorry, the same uh, ratio. And so we'll track height will be uh, 25. And so we now have 25 pixels for the whole data range. And instead of auto scale, let's set the vertical viewing range. So it's at the same scale, no matter where we go and hit submit. And then it asks you to save your session under a new name. I'm not going to do that. Um, but you can see the value of having sessions and having your own login and so forth. You can create your own login. You don't have to use Australia 2018 for the rest of your life. But we do that thing where we send you an email and you confirm that you're not a robot and you have to create a new password. And so rather than have you all do that right now and create a whole bunch of new accounts, I'll leave that up to you to create your own new accounts uh, uh, at your leisure. And so now we have the top of the peaks sitting here on top of that track at the same, uh, uh, same ratio of pixels to data points as the original data track were. So I'll stop there and uh, stop my sharing and uh, let you carry on, uh, unless you have questions. Hello, welcome back. We are talking about questions number six and seven in this uh, segment here. Looks like I have 15 minutes, so. Uh, 6A is look at a region that has changed from HG19 to 38. And this is to give you a little idea of uh, how the browser uh, uh, shows uh, different types of data and also how the genome consortium makes changes from one assembly to another. So let's start with my data, my sessions, and we will load a session from username example as we have before if the browser will let me on that page, there we go. And then um, HG19 underscore uh, K I F, there we go, five C gap. And that's the gene K I F five C, there's a gap in it. And we're on HG19 uh, at this point. And this is by way of illustration of uh, uh, to get to the bottom line first is the uh, genome consortium took this big gap out of the middle of this gene. Uh, it was a, uh, a region that had a large gap in it. And you can see that by the scale bar that it's about 100 KB in size. And in fact, if you click into it, it is exactly 100 KB in size. And so for some reason, they uh, just didn't have any reads that spanned this region. And they had some kind of evidence early on in the HD19 process that made them think that there was a gap here, that there was DNA missing that had not been uh, um, included in the uh, reference assembly. And so it says, note the size of this region and note the gap uh, with the track turned on. So the size of the region is a quarter million bases. The gap is around 100 KB. Um, did I miss something? Okay, yeah, I missed something in, in my printout here of, eight, of uh, 6A. Either that or I didn't include it in the PDF. Um, but it's supposed to go to HG. Something's weird about my, uh, my printout, but so let's just go now. So uh, view and other genomes convert. 
I hope I didn't leave this out of the version you guys were were looking at. Maybe you can comment to uh, Lou on the thread somehow. Um, so we go to HD 38 now, and you can uh, use that as a uh, uh, direct navigation. You can jump from this region to the same region in a lot of other uh, animals uh, as well. So if we submit this, we're looking at this region in HD 38, and uh, we'll get a little statistical uh, report about how it differs from 19 to 38. So you see it covers the whole span, so the ends are the same, but it's only 61% of the bases. And if we click into that, you'll see that uh, essentially we come to a region in HD38 where we're still in the KIFC, KIF5C region, but we're only 150 KB now, and the gap is missing. So you can see the gap track right here in light uh, in green when I mouse over it. The track uh, long label is still there, but there are no data, so it's just kind of collapsed there. And uh, we can ignore the rhesus and bush baby uh, alignments right here on HD38. The, uh, uh, the gap is missing. So then in 6B, it says use BLAT to um, get a better appreciation for the region. So we want to get the DNA from this region flanking the large gap in, uh, and BLAT it back. So we have to get the DNA because we don't know where the gap was uh, in uh, HG38. So let's go back to uh, HG19. Is that what we want to do? 50 KB. Let's just, oh darn it. Let's grab, let's grab 25 KB from the middle of this window and hope we picked it up. So I think this particular uh, let's, let's, uh, let's zoom into this region, about 25 KB in the middle. You can see from the top of the screen how much is 25 KB. I hope we pick up the gap here. So we'll zoom into that, and then we'll get DNA from HD38. So maybe I missed a step because I'm not looking at the full thing. Darn. So view DNA. We'll just get the whole chunk of DNA here from HG38 and hope we picked up the spot that includes the gap on the 19. So we'll highlight all of it and copy. We'll go back one. We'll go view BLAT. And we'll switch to HG19 now and BLAT all that DNA from 38 back to 19 and submit. And we'll see where it... Uh, where it aligns on 19. So that's weird. When I printed this out, I wind up, wound up with a gap at the end of some pages. And so here's a big chunk, 100% match on uh, HG19. And we'll go back to the browser and see how we did. Where are we relative to the gap in 38? So here's the DNA, it spans the window. Let's zoom out by a factor of uh, three. And we'll see where we are relative. So I just missed that sequence. Okay, so I'm gonna do it. Uh, here's the big contig with the gap in it. So I just missed the gap. So I think we have enough time. I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna zoom out by one and a half. So the, the bottom line is, it's just, despite all of my jumping around here, and uh, I apologize for the incompleteness of my following my own instructions here, uh, the bottom line is that essentially that gap disappeared in HG38. And uh, if we zoom into this region right here like this, and then jump from here back to 38, We'll only have a little bit of flanking regions on either side of the uh, um, view and other genomes. We'll only have a little bit of actual DNA on either side of this gap. So a gap is actually annotated as a bunch of ends. And so there's no essentially no sequence in the uh, 
the gap that's of any value to uh, uh, using GLAT or any annotations. So there are no annotations in the gap also. So here we are, there's only six KB here. So now if we get the DNA from this region, somewhere in the middle of this region, and HG38 is the place where there used to be a gap in HG19. So now we'll get DNA from this region. And we'll get all of the DNA, copy that, go back to BLAT, and you'll see how we'll essentially have um, tools BLAT. And we'll blot that back to 19. And we'll go to the browser to this first link here. And it will pick up a block um, right to the uh, one side of that gap. And see, so here we are. This HD38 DNA spanned across this gap. And so essentially the gap was just thrown away. So let's look at number seven. Uh, human chromosome two shares homology, my data, my sessions, with two different chimp chromosomes. There was, a, was there a fusion event in the human lineage or was there a split of the ancestral chromosome two into two new chromes in the chimp lineage? And the um, the session that we load will actually show you the region of chromosome two in its entirety. So HD19 underscore chromosome two chimp and submit. And so these are the chain, uh, I'm sorry, these are the net tracks that are actually one of the steps along the way to making the uh, conservation track that we uh, uh, looked at earlier. And the net track is, is a, uh, an attempt to show a one-to-one -one relationship between the two animals, in this case, between chimp and human. So we're on human chromosome uh, two, and the chimp DNA has been aligned to it. And so the net track is a distillation of data that come out of a, of a, a chain track. So we do an all-by-all -all alignment, and we wind up chaining together pieces that are in the same order and orientation in the two animals. And then when we chain them together, we wind up with pieces that are um, essentially the longest chain shows you the backbone of the original or chromosome from the common ancestor. So if I zoom into a region right here near the uh, centromere of human, and I know it's a centromere because there's a lot of rearrangements around it, and there's a pretty good sized gap uh, in the middle of the original uh, the place there because there can be no alignment to a place that's a gap. And so you can see here in the ideogram that the centromere is just off screen to the right relative to the spot we uh, zoomed in here. And you can see here's a place where this big chunk of chromosome is in the same order and orientation as that chunk and the same order and orientation as that third chunk, uh, leaving a gap where there's an inversion. So here's a place where chimp chromosome two has an inversion so it's in the same orient, I'm sorry, the same order, but it's not in the same orientation. So it's not part of the same chain. And so level two of the net track then uh, fills it in in the gap of the upper track. And then level three fills in any chunk that's uh, left by the, um, the filling of the longest piece. So the longest chain that fits it goes in the next level. And then the longest chain that fits it there goes into the next level. So this is the centromere of human with chimp aligned to it. And if we zoom out uh, a couple of tenfolds, we pick up the, uh, uh, the break point here. So chimp chromosome 2A and chromosome, chimp chromosome 2B align to human chromosome 2. And they actually got their names because of that homology. Now there's a region right here where the, uh, uh, there's a lot of rearrangement And you can see that, that that region has a lot of rearrangement also, but it's way over here on the, the long arm of uh, uh, chromosome two in human. So I'll zoom out a little bit more to pick up the breakpoint again. Let's zoom out by 1.5x. 
I'm not actually following the protocol very closely right now um, because we're running out of time and I wanted to uh, get in, into the, uh, uh, the kind of the take home lesson here is the way to see the um, uh, whether or not it was a fusion event or a splitting event is to go into the uh, track controls here and turn on another um, or two uh, great apes to see how they look. So let's turn on gorilla and orangutan and we see we have the nets on at full and the chains on to hide and we'll simply uh, submit that and we'll go back and see that the uh, result is that the uh, uh, gorilla and orangutan have a similar uh, pattern. So if the original chromosome was a fused chromosome and that it's split in the chimp lineage, then you'd have to hypothesize that it also split in gorilla and it also split in orangutan, which is not really very reasonable to assume that you'd have three separate splitting events in three separate lineage uh, lineages. It's much more likely that you had a uh, uh, two separate chromosomes in all three of these animals and that in the human lineage, you have had a single event, a single fusion event, which created chromosome two in human. And uh, then after the fact, chromosome two of human had to get rid of that second centromere over here in this region where you have all this rearrangement because the likelihood of a break, uh, well, chromosomes break when you have two centromeres on them. Sometimes they go to the same daughter cell in mitosis and or meiosis. And sometimes they go to opposite cells and then you have chromosome breakage. And so that would be a, uh, an event that kept human and chimp lineages uh, separate pretty soon when the human lineage got rid of the extra centromere and went on its merry way. It would actually have um, uh, a reproductive barrier there at the cellular level, at the chromosomal level, to keep the two lineages separate. So I think we're out of time with respect to uh, this particular part of the demo, but uh, the 10 minute break will give you a chance to come up with some questions. While I look for a slide that shows the, at the renaming of the chromosomes, they renamed a whole bunch of them. And uh, I have it somewhere in my slide deck, although I hadn't planned to show it, but I can see now that it would be useful to do so. So I'm gonna stop the sharing, I'm gonna turn off the mic and look for that slide. Hi folks, we're back. It's 40, so I'm supposed to get questions for five minutes. And I'm gonna grab this one here from the bottom of the discussion board. Uh, if somebody wants to type it in there to answer it for completeness, that's, that's fine. I'm gonna change the spelling of coloring though. It drives me crazy the way you guys do that. But <laughs> feel free to change it back. Um, so the question is, does the color key for the chromosomes at the bottom of the graphic refer to the coloring for human chromosomes? or is it uh, conventional coloring? So let's go back to the graphic and look at it. Um, the human chromosome is the backbone here that everything is mapped to. So there's nothing in color here um, that indicates one chromosome or another of human. So chromosome two is the, uh, the graph, if you will, the axis that everything's aligned to. If you put your mouse over this, uh, it is correct. This one here matches chromosome on, and this other one here matches chromosome two. And we had to choose a second color because of the way the chimp chromosomes were named. If we, in fact, when they first renamed the chromosomes, this particular graphic, I used to show this graphic way back on HG17 and tell that same story. But then um, the chimp chromosomes were re renamed A and B and our code simply called them the same because they're both chromosomes two essentially and it just ignored the A and B and you couldn't tell this breakpoint at all. And then we went ahead and did a special case to, to label one of them on just because it's unspecified uh, for 2B. And uh, I'll show you this graphic again. This is the original human chromosome and chip chromosomes were named by their size based on a chromosome squash and a photo micrograph and lined up and cut out of the paper and so forth. And it turned out that when they finally sequenced chimp, the chimp's chromosomes 12 and 13 matched human chromosome two. And so they renamed them 12, 2A and 2B. And so, uh, because prior to that, um, the second biggest chimp chromosome matched 
chrome three of human, the third biggest match chrome four of human. So to make them match by homology, they aligned them uh, so that three matched three and four matched four, and then they renamed two A and two B so that they matched human two. And then of course, when you get down here, 12 and 13 are missing. Um, and so they had, to re, they had to renumber them. So everything's got this one-to-one -one relationship now with a human to chimp. Um, but chimp has one extra chromosome and it's because of that, uh, that fusion event in the uh, human lineage. So do we have any other questions coming in uh, on the discussion board? Okay, so we can actually type in an answer here afterwards that uh, is a little shorter, more concise answer than what I just did in the live. So Bob gets questions. I have a minute or two of questions. And then there's a summary of workshop. Does it say who's supposed to do that summary? Let me look here. That's all you. That's me too. Ah, I got nothing. I got nothing for summary. I do want to apologize for what, when I was doing, printed my hard copy here of 6A, and 6B, it uh, chopped some stuff off at the bottom of the page when I printed it out. So I don't know what happened to that. For some time, you also have eight, which is the spreadsheet that you want to Oh, eight, the spreadsheet thing. That is a little bit long, but I can, rather than, I'll let you go get the spreadsheet yourself by following the directions, but I actually have a spreadsheet myself that I can, uh, I have a copy of it here. So let's go to uh, Excel. UCSC links, there it is. I did have it open recently. So this is a spreadsheet that you could use to uh, grab links, pre-made links. And so if you had a whole bunch of data on, your, uh, on a spreadsheet of your own and you wanted to have a, a link for each row of the data that jumps you directly to UCSC, here are some of the formats of the type of data that you can uh, uh, make links for. Um, the Wikipedia, or I'm sorry, the genome wiki page that I referenced in number eight uh, gives you some hints about how to uh, make links yourself. And uh, th these are pre-made links. So if you want to customize your links, you can go to that page and read about it. Or you can simply type the word links into our uh, help page on the browser itself. I go here to the browser, we hit help. You can go in here to the documentation or the FAQs and type links and get some more information about how to make them. Uh, for example, this is a link here at uh, HG19, which will take you to a gene name. And for example, if I type in a different gene name, like NF1 there, then this link right here will open up a browser on HG19, and it'll open us up to uh, the NF1 gene uh, on uh, HG19. So while I wait for that to load, I'll go back to the spreadsheet and shrink it a little bit. I'll keep an eye on the loading over here, there it is. So here we're at the NF1 gene, and it turned on the decipher track, and it turned on uh, some of these other tracks. It kept the tracks that were already on, the chimp, gorilla, and orangutan track, and it turned on uh, the OMIM genes track. And if I put my mouse over this, you can see I can't point it out anymore, but it can, you can see that it says, and OMIM gene two equals pack, and decipher equals pack, and HG um, SNP138 equals dense. And so you simply get the table name and you say ampersand table name equals visibility level. So you can turn on any track you want by adding that to the URL. So let's say we had a list of genes in our spreadsheet, such as BRCA1 and FGFR2 and FGFR3 uh, and so forth. And then we wanted to make a, a list of uh, uh, links so I could copy that link here and copy that down the page here and then any one of these links I could do that down here um, SOD1 so this becomes a link to SOD1 uh, you can actually see that when the mouse over right there it's interpreted it because the way the link is uh, uh, designed it grabs the data from two cells to my left but let's say the uh, location in your spreadsheet, two cells to the right of your list of genes, or if you're using this set up here, uh, two links to the right of your coordinates is already occupied by other data. You might not want to uh, overwrite it with UCSC links. So you can actually take a link like this and drag it 
five or six or seven links to the right. And because of the way Excel works, this drag or move still refers to, if I put the mouse over it now, it's still referring to the gene name. So you can see in the URL there, the third line down, it says BRCA1. So by dragging it to the right, the right number of columns, it's now referring to the gene, whatever that is, eight cells to my left. And if I copy that down the list, it still makes a link. And so if I click on this link over here, it's now in the column that you want it to be in, you know, eight or nine columns to the right of your, um, your data. And then you can take uh, that link out of this spreadsheet, copy it into your own spreadsheet and have it work uh, just the same. So uh, you can use these uh, different types. You can use all kinds of uh, identifiers. You can use an RSID number here. And uh, you can see up here in the spreadsheet how it's using the values two cells to my left and grabbing uh, data out of it. And it says, okay, it's single search equals SNP 150. So it's searching the SNP 150 table to grab the, uh, uh, the RSID number and make uh, a link directly to that, S that RSID number in the, uh, the genome browser. So in terms of a summary of the workshop, I hope that the two webinars and the hands-on stuff that we did today uh, have given you a, a sense of how the browser operates and a sense of how to think about the browser. And if you don't use the browser on human, um, the same features apply in a lot of cases. The navigational aids uh, apply the same way. The way you think about loading your own data in terms of uh, data with a second dimension, such as the uh, RNA-seq data, how you can manipulate those data uh, in terms of how you can change the visibility. Uh, the word manipulate is loaded with implications. So we're not manipulating data as much as we're um, manipulating the display of it to make it suit your needs. Uh, one thing I didn't mention that I probably should have is that we have a view in PDF uh, feature up here, which lets you take a picture once you have it and export it into a PDF, which is a, um, you download the graphic in PDF. And because PDFs are vector graphics, you can um, zoom them in and zoom them out to uh, a very large size. And so once you've saved the PDF, you can pull it up into Photoshop and you can make uh, the graphic at 300 dots per inch at any region of the genome uh, browser image you want, uh, which is suitable for uploading for your paper and uh, science or nature or something like that. Because a browser graphic, if you go back to the main browser graphic here and you uh, simply save the image via right click, something like that, it's going to be at uh, 100 dots per inch and it won't be as, uh, uh, if you view the image there and save that, it'll be a PNG image that doesn't scale in the same way as it would if you were uh, uh, try using the PDF and then you won't be able to uh, submit it without it being fuzzy around the edges. Okay, so that's the uh, host tanks and trainers. So uh, is there a question? Or? Okay, I thought you were raising your hand over there. So I'm gonna stop my share and let Pip take over and I'll turn off my microphone. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for your interest in the genome browser. I'm thrilled that you spent so much time with us. I know how busy you all are and uh, to spend this big a chunk of time is uh, truly an honor for us to bring the browser to you in this time. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Bob and Louie very much for all their hard work on this. And I think especially that Bob's demos were um, really valuable for everyone. So we hope that you're now um, feeling confident to use the extensive functionality available in the UCSA Genome Browser for your own research. And thanks for attending today. I'm just going to share my screen um, briefly. There we, go. we hope you'll join us for our next session on the 14th of November, which will look at using Galaxy Australia to analyse metagenomics data. You can sign up for this now on the EMBL ABR website and the link is there on my screen. Um, and just then you'll just have to click the registration link for your participating node. And don't forget the recording of today's training will be made available on the EMBL ABR YouTube channel for your future reference. 
Just two more quick things before you leave. Um, please um, fill out this evaluation so that we can improve the training that we offer. We're really interested in your feedback, both on content and also on the um, mode of deliver delivery um, across the multiple venues, what, what worked and what didn't. There's a link at the bottom of the discussion board and also at the bottom of the schedule, I think, to, to this feedback, feedback survey. So um, please stay for five minutes to finish this short survey. Um, I'd also like to have a quick thank you to Nathan Watson Haig, who's an help, a helper in Adelaide, who I um, neglected to mention at the start. So thanks, Nathan. And finally, we'd like to acknowledge the funders who made this training possible. Um, funding and support from Bioplatforms Australia and the University of Melbourne to EMBL ABR, and support from the Australasian Genomic Technologies Association for this UCSE Genome Browser series. So thanks again, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. <laughs>